Hey guys, Johnny O here, the guy who says bell peppers and beef need beef to be called bell peppers and beef. And I'm here once again to talk about UFC Fight Night, Blades vs. Aspinall. So without further ado, let's get to the fights. I'm, I'm not going to start with the main event uh, for some obvious reasons, if you watched it. But let's first talk about Patty the Batty Pimblet versus Jordan Levitt, the Monkey King. Going into this fight, I really liked Levitt's chances. You know, he's a really good grappler. He might be able to actually match Patty at his own game. Because, like, for me, Patty isn't, like, a striker. He's more of, like, just, like, a grappler. Um, when he strikes, his chin's up in the air. Big hooks coming from here. So I was like, ah, you know. The UFC isn't going to put anyone who, like, who's a very good striker, or at least a good striker, uh, in front of Patty just yet after he nearly got decapitated in his debut. So they're they're going to give someone who really isn't that known for the striking is more of a grappler uh, for Patty. And, you know, I was like, ah, you know, this guy might, you know, kind of bite him back. And out the gate, Patty was defending takedowns constantly. He was jumping on guillotines. It looked like he almost had it at one point. He had, like, a really high angle, and he was readjusting the hands well. Um, but eventually, actually, at one point, he when he goes for, like, his second or third guillotine, uh, Levitt knew he was going to drop for it and he actually just was ready for it and just countered him dropping for a guillotine to get side control really easy. That was, that was a really cool moment for me. Um, but near the end of the round, you know, Patty isn't like taking any damage. He's just being controlled a little bit. Um, and I thought Levitt won the first round, but at the end of the first round, Patty, when they're on the feet, does swarm with some good shots, hurts Levitt, and when the fight does go to the ground again, he's on top and mount, just pounding him out and the the round ends with him just landing some great shots. He could have ended it right there, honestly. If you give him like another 30 seconds, probably was over. Um, in the second round, Levitt's going for more takedowns. And with good head and arm control, potentially looking for another choke uh, from Patty. And uh, Levitt's doing that, whole, you know, where you put your hand on the mat to not get knee in the head. And the second he took his hand off the mat, he got knee. I thought it was illegal at first because I, I was kind of in and out looking around. Um, and, uh, <laughs> well... It's on me, but it, you know, it was a hundred percent illegal shot, and Levitt's hurt bad. And at that point, Patty takes his back, traps the arm with the with the body lock, with his hooks in, um, very BJ Penn esque. Didn't didn't do it with the body triangle like BJ Penn used to do, but he did it with the body hooks, which is very good. And he had him locked in and went for the choke. Two arms against one, he's gonna get that choke most likely, and he does. And that's a second round rear naked choke win for Patty the Batty. And I'm I'm honestly not a Patty fan at all, uh, you know, uh, but I will say this though, this fight impressed me. I I do think he needs to be given that step up in competition. Uh, whenever someone the UFC wants to hype someone up, I go, oh, that's okay. Like, well, let's see him fight someone like really good then, you know. Especially if the person they're hyping is a big talker. So it's like, oh, okay, I double want to see you fight someone good because I want to know if you're legit or not. And. So I'm, I'm maybe I'm like trying to throw him too, maybe I'm like too harsh on him because of that. This is his third fight overall, after all. But still, I, I do want like a good step up in competition. I thought this was a little too low of a step up, but it was still a step up from his last fight against Gabriel Vargas. Um, and I know Taporia wants him, and that fight isn't going to happen. Taporia just took everything Jai Herbert could throw at him, but you know, including the kitchen sink, and then. <laughs> Just second round, Tapuria just clobbers him with some pretty solid boxing combinations and amazing power. I don't, I don't think the UFC is rushing to make that matchup. But another name that I think you could toss out there and have some fun with is Claudio Puyes. I, I think that sounds like an awesome fight. Two good grapplers, um, and they're both have some interesting striking styles, so it could be pretty fun. So that's my recommendation for that, at least for Patty. Then we had the co-main event, and this was a fight I was actually really hyped for. It was Chris Curtis versus Jack Hermanson, and I fully expected Chris Curtis to live up to the hype and just stalk Hermanson for a finish after hurting him uh, with some patient boxing. Uh, instead, Hermanson fought a really smart fight, and I thought it was entertaining, personally. Um, and so Hermanson was attacking the lead leg constantly of, of Chris Curtis with a lead leg low kick because it's a orthodox southpaw, uh, another of these 
close close guard open guard kind of matchups. So he's just kicking the close guard outside low kick constantly, and he's circling off, landing long punches and even some roundhouse kicks constantly. And he's never staying stationary for Chris Curtis to get his boxing moving, and he's just circling him forever, and it's working. And he's just lighting him up for three rounds. It's kind of awesome in a way. Uh, I was really frustrating though for me being a Chris Curtis guy. I was really impressed by his two fights in the UFC and his contender series run or his fight in the contender series years ago. Um, but it was really frustrating to see him 14 minutes into the fight realize, hey, maybe I should stop chasing in a straight line and cut the cage. But he did say on Twitter he was having like a bad night. He felt like he choked a bit. The bright lights kind of got to him. So maybe, you know. But uh, for three rounds, from answers just kind of lighting him up with kicks and staying on the outside. In the second round, he hits him with a high kick, partially blocked, and definitely Curtis isn't isn't all there. He, he's a little hurt. You know, his back leg kind of stutter stepped, and he just swarms with like elbows, like kind of like doing the elbows where he brings him down, like downward elbows, reeking him in, like upward. It was so cool, um, just swarming him with these elbows. And he could have got the finish, but, you know, Curtis covered up and got out of there. And Curtis was frustrated after being shut down for three rounds. At the end of the fight, he throws up the double birds. Uh, and, like, Hermanson gets an- gets angry right back, rightfully so. And it was almost like another near altercation after the fight. And I think that's so funny to think about for me. Because it's like, the the idea of, of having getting into another fight immediately after a fight, where one guy clearly won... It's like, what was the point? You, like, this dude just beat you. Like, are you going to do fight me? Like, okay, I just, I'll just i just do this again. I don't know. It's always kind of the vibe I have. Uh, that's just me. I just thought it was kind of funny. Um, and, you know, unanimous decision went for Hermanson. And Chris Curtis had a small hype train derailed. And honestly, I, I, I did like the fight, though. I know some people were kind of complaining about it. But I think it's because the rest of the fights on this card were either not good or just were disappointing speaking of perfect transition let's get to our main event and this was disappointing this was a disappointing one and i'm i really wanted a big showing from aspinall here i'm a big fan of his i really like him and i'm i'm honestly a little tired of curtis blades just being around to derail any potential hype that could come up in the heavyweight division Um, and that's not fair to blades he's just doing his job He's just he's beating the guys they put in front of him. That's not his fault, and I'm, that's unfair to me. But that's just how I my heart like my emo, I emotionally react to it, I guess. Um, so Aspinall comes out, you know, looking for some heavy leather, very aggressive, and he takes a good right hand on the chin. And I went, oh, like as like you know those moments where like it's right before it lands. I went, oh, it's over. <laughs> I just saw the knockout shot, but Aspinall took it on the chin, kept going forward, and he's looking for like punching com- punching combinations, ending with kicks. And they're both kind of throwing, but then suddenly, after ret- after landing a low kick, he retracts back, he steps on the leg wrong, and he falls to the ground in pain. It's over. It sounded like, I think, an MCL tear or an ACL tear. I think they said MCL. And it's just, man, awful stuff. And he, I feel bad for both guys. Because, not not just Tom Aspinall, obviously I feel bad for him, I feel awful for Tom Aspinall, but Curtis Blades too, because you spend, you know, so long training for a fight, and you only spend 15 seconds in it. And, and, and it's not like you beat him in 15 seconds, he got hurt in 15 seconds. And I think that's, uh, I think that's rough. Uh, and honestly, two weekends in a row now, where we have an injury in the main event, I'm fully expecting, and I'm willing to see if there's like a Vegas betting odds for it. Uh, if Pena or Nunez are going to slip on a banana peel Mario Kart style on the way to the octagon next weekend. Because uh, it's just seeming like a run of bad luck. And then for the rest of the card, some brief notes for the rest of the card. Molly McCann uh, nearly came out real quick, real aggressive. It was kind of awesome and nearly got another spinning elbow finish. But, uh, you know, spinning elbow didn't get the job done, so she just kept throwing punches and you know, put her opponent out. It was awesome. Hannah Goldie. It's pretty cool. Um, Volkan Ozdemir fought the perfect game plan against Paul Craig. He just kept throwing him off his legs and hips. And when, whenever Paul Craig would would drag it to the ground, like usually pulling guard, he would just try and get up. He wouldn't stay on the ground for too long because he knows he's going to get tapped. And uh, just kind of beat him up on the feet. But he's a better striker. He knows what he has to do, and he did it. 
great stuff. Uh, probably not the most fun thing for a Paul Craig fan, but you know it is what it is. And then lastly, Nikita Krylov, one of my boys, TKO's Alexander Gustafsson in less than a minute, leading to a potential retirement scenario for Gus, who's one of my favorites ever too. It was about that time. Um, yeah, so honestly, this card wasn't very good. I think a lot of us are kind of, kind of, you know, if we saw it, it wasn't a very good card at all. Um, but I, you know, this is like karma. You know, earlier this year we got a London card, and it was outrageous. Could be argued card of the year. It was very, very, very good. And we've had a lot of very, very good fights this year. Um, we had we had another fight of the year contender last week, right? You know what I mean? So it, it's just kind of the way things kind of balance out, I suppose. At least that's what I'm telling myself. That's how I'm coping. But that's all I have, though. But be sure to check out the preview show for UFC 277. And I, I can't wait personally. I've done a lot of research for it. I'm very excited to be on it again. And it's another pay-per-view week. So a retro review. It's coming out. I'm very excited for this one. I was really happy to talk about such a monumental event uh, as well. And something a little different. I don't know if I've spoiled it already exactly what it is. But it's a little different than what I normally do on retro reviews. So I'm definitely pumped. And as always, I'll be here next weekend to recap UFC 277. But for now, I'm Joe with the INC. Thank you for watching.